right. Uh, yeah, hey, Adam mentioned that. We're also in May. You can look on the events page. We're gonna, uh, we have two uh, four Denver events that we'll be doing uh, in the community. We'll be doing some uh, stuff in the community cleaning up. One of those is uh, cleaning up Inspire Elementary, where if you've been with us uh, for a little while, that's actually where we used to worship pr- prior to that uh, worldwide pandemic thing we had called COVID uh, when we were in the schools and all of that. The, the name that will remain nameless, right? Uh, but we'll be, have an opportunity to clean up over at that school. But, so look on those QR codes to, to get involved in our Fort Denver Day as well. Uh, hey, uh, I want to start off by saying this. One, if you have kids in the room, uh, we do this very intentionally. Four times a year, it's on average four times a year, uh, we bring our kids point in. Uh, and so this is on our fifth Sundays. And so we do that very intentionally, um, not just because we want to give uh, uh, our people that serve in our kids' ministry a break, although that is one reason, uh, not just because uh, we love kids, that is one reason, but we want them to experience big church. Um, so if you, if you had any church background growing up, it was like big church, right? And so we want them to experience the same thing that mom and dad experience, right? And so I need you to know this. I have a 14, 12, 10, and six-year-old. Um, distractions are never a problem for me <laughs> because my life is a little bit of a distraction with four kids. And so your kids in here this morning are not going to bother me or anyone else in here, okay? So I want you to know that wholeheartedly. I know every time, like, when my kids are there, I'm like, oh, oh are they going to say something to it? No, nobody's thinking that. We're fine. We're all in the same boat. And uh, the greatest thing, Adam kind of uh, went by it a little bit, but when I hear a little bit of a rustling in the chairs from kids, I often think that's the sound of the next generation of the church. And so praise God that there can be a next generation of the church. So it's not going to bother me at all. Um, So uh, kids, maybe you've heard of this before. I know you have because parents, uh, we abuse this. It's called the golden rule. Um, So if you've heard of the golden rule in your house, maybe it's been said another way, but you've heard this statement before, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Kids, have you heard that before? Yeah, maybe teachers have said that. We, we really, as adults, we love to abuse that. Um, and uh, not just abuse it, we are trying to teach you. Uh, but we use that a lot. It's our way of saying, why in the world would you do something to someone else that you wouldn't want them to do to you, right? We just, I, hey, don't do this because you wouldn't want them to do this thing to you, so you don't do it to them. And, and then often from my kids, I, I hear the, but, but, but he hit me, <laughs> Maybe that's just my house, or uh, but he did this, or but she did that, and I'm like, oh, okay, sweet. And then I'll turn to my kids and I'll say, okay, go ahead and do it back to them. And they look at me like, what? And I'm like, well, it's okay. You did that to them because they hit you, so it's okay if they hit you again because you're doing unto others as they've done unto you, right? That's the golden rule: do unto others as they've done unto you. No, it's not at all. It's do unto others as you would want them to do unto you, and. Believe it or not, whether you're a follower of Christ or you're here processing your thoughts about Christianity or, quite frankly, maybe you don't believe in the whole thing, Um, this is something that was not just originated with smart men across the world. This is something that we get actually from the scriptures themselves, from Jesus himself. In Luke chapter 6, it's a gospel account that talked about the life, the death, the burial, resurrection, and the ministry of Jesus. Um, In the scripture accounts, if you have a a Bible that has red letters, this is one of those red letter moments which indicates Jesus was talking. Jesus said this. He said, just as you want others to do for you, do the same for them. You know, we really think we're smart and brilliant in this world that we live in, but a lot of what we get from our leadership, from our life, is actually based in the scriptures. That phrase comes in a a section of the scriptures that's actually titled, Love Your Enemies. Kids, can you do me a favor and just say, ugh? Yeah, like, love your enemies? Like, I'm not going to lie. Like, KD, Chris Paul, Aiton, these guys, Brooks, I'm not a Suns fan right now. They're my enemy the next couple of games. Hopefully just the next three games. Can I get an amen for that? That's And if none of you have any idea what I'm talking about, I'm talking about the Nuggets and Suns basketball game. Like, love your enemies? Who in the world would do that? But listen, this is centered around the teachings of Jesus that were very primary in everything that he did, everything that happened in the scriptures, and they came from teachings that he told everybody, which was this, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself, but this is weird. We've talked about this past couple of weeks Because we use the word love so strangely, right? Kids, you probably love pizza, but you also love your mom, right? 
And that seems a little bit weird that you can love those two things the same, pizza and your mom or your dad or your grandparents or whoever else. Don't you think your mom maybe feels bad that you use that word the same way? The love your neighbor phrase actually comes from the Old Testament portion of the Bible in the Hebrew scriptures. And the word love is the word ahava. And so Jesus is saying, love your neighbor. It originated, originated from the Hebrew scriptures. But Jesus actually spoke in a, a cousin language of Hebrew that was Aramaic. And in Aramaic, the word love was rachma. And so you have this ahava, you have this rachma. Jesus is talking about love your neighbor and love God and love your neighbor. But then um, the followers of Jesus began to spread the good news or the gospel of Jesus. They began to spread the language in a Greek language. And in this Greek language, which was like the common man's language, where everyone could understand it, and it could be spread worldwide because it wasn't compartmentalized. And we know that too. If you've, uh, I'm from the South, so I feel like I can say this, but I've had conversations with people from the South that I still don't really understand what they meant. Um, and also the same for people in the Northeast and like New York City, right? Coffee and quarters and all this other kind of stuff, right? We, we had these different languages and the Greek language was bringing the language together so everyone could understand what was going on. And when they spread the word love, they used the word agape. It's an agape love. And catch this, when they defined agape love, they actually used the life of Jesus for their definition of what agape love was. A lot of times we think of definitions and we think of people that embody a certain word and they knew that love, agape love, was the type of love that Jesus displayed with his life. Let me give you a quick example. Um, a, a, there's one example. Jesus was asked, what is the most important command in all of the scriptures? In which he replied with a, a portion of the Shema, which was a prayer that the Jewish people prayed. And he says this out of Deuteronomy 6, 5. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart. So he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart. But he didn't stop there in this question about what was the greatest uh, command. He followed up by saying another command from the Old Testament portion of the Bible from Leviticus. He said, but love your neighbor as yourself. So love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. So can I ask you a question? What is more important, loving God or loving your neighbor? God. God. Loving God or loving your neighbor? And Jesus would say, the answer is yes, it's both. Jesus' answer would be that we need to love God and our neighbor and what Jesus is really saying by this person asking the command is that if we even must ask the question, it means that we do not get the point of what Jesus was actually saying. This was two sides of the same coin, if you've heard that analogy before. Loving God and loving neighbor were two sides of the same coin. You see, our love for God is expressed in our love for others. Like our love for God is expressed by our love for people, and that's that's harsh, because that means that our love is not expressed in our knowledge. That means that love is not expressed in our attendance. It means that love is not expressed in the programs that we attend. It means that love is not expressed in the boxes that we want to check or the bank accounts that we have or anything else. Our love is expressed in our love for people. And Jesus shows us here that love is action. And we should know that from Jesus above anybody else, right? We should know that from him because he's part of the love that we see from God. Like Jesus is the embodiment of the love that we have from God the Father, the imparted in the person and work of Jesus Christ. It was action-oriented love by God to send his son Jesus Christ for us in our sin. The past couple of weeks, we've talked about our love for others, right? We're in this series called Relationship Goals, where we've been walking through the four loves that we see in and throughout the scriptures. We started off week one talking about love for our friendships, right? This philia, Philadelphia, brotherly love type of love that we have, right? We ask, do, do you know your eight? The eight people that you know that would be ones carrying your casket upon your deathbed. 
Do you have your eight friends and the love that you have for them? Adam did a great job of challenging us last week in our storge love, the love for family, that, that family-oriented love that we have. We do family worship. We actually do love our families, and Adam challenged us in, that, in, uh, challenged us in the way we express love to our family. And today, we are talking about the highest form of love that we see in all of the Bible. It's agape love. This love is referenced all throughout the scriptures, but the, the embodiment of it is that agape love is everlasting and it's sacrificial. It's the highest form of love that we can possibly have. And, and check this out. The neat thing about the agape love, this everlasting and sacrificial love, is that you give that same love, the giver gives this love, even when that love is not received in return to the person that you give it to. That's agape love. Uh, Agape love isn't like, I'm going to love you if you do this thing for me. Hey, scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. But agape love is this love that when the giver gives it, even when the receiver does not give anything back, you're still giving this everlasting, sacrificial type of love. This is the love that God embodies. This is the love that we see by him sending his son Jesus for us even when we didn't show him love in return. When the receiver did not give the giver the love in return. And guess what? God isn't like us. He doesn't get calloused hearts and say, well, I'll only scratch your back if you scratch mine. He continually shows and displays an agape love to us even in spite of us. Um, And that's hard because if, if we're being honest, some of you Some of us, me, have hard relationships, and our hearts can become a little bit calloused to those hard relationships that we have, and and we don't really want to give love to those people that have not given us love, or we don't want to give love to people that have rejected us before or have not mended or healed relationships that have been broken and splintered before, and so it's hard to love other people, and what's really hard about loving other people sometimes is that we can't do it because we have a hard time loving ourselves. We have a hard time loving who I am or what I've become or the things that I have done. And I want to tell you this, you'll never love other people until you first love yourself. You can, and we'll break that down. Don't hear what I'm not saying, but you will never love other people unless you first love yourself. I promise you that. And let me say it again in this way. Loving yourself allows you to love others. I would even go as far as saying loving yourself commands you to love others, and we'll see that from the scriptures this morning. Um, The epicenter of agape love is a verse that we all know, no matter your church background, even if you're brand new to Christianity, you've more than likely seen this verse plastered somewhere, you've heard it, someone has used it as well, but it comes from John 3, 16. You all know it, this is from the CSB translation, maybe not the one you learned it in, Um, certainly for me either, but it says, for God so loved, or God loved the world this way, that he gave his one and only son, so that everyone, could you do me a favor, say the word everyone. everyone. In the original language, everyone, you know what it means? Everyone. It means everyone. And so you can just place yourself there, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life life. God loves you so much that he sacrificially gave up his son for you. He agape you so much that he gave his only son for you. I mean, you can read that, for God agape the world in this way. That's what that verse means. And I know some of you are thinking that God doesn't love you. You're thinking things like, God can't love me. You don't know, Chris. But when I see that this verse says the world and things like everyone, I have to look at it and say, no, 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 you are in that verse as well. He gave his son so that you could be loved in this way and sacrificed for that way. You see, what happens is we often put stipulations on God's love ourselves that God is not putting stipulations on himself. We start to put stipulations on the love that we can receive from God that he's not putting stipulations on the love that he gives. And it's backwards. And not only that, let's not forget Jesus in this agape love as well. 
Like this is love from God to send his son Jesus, but it also pictures the agape love that Jesus had for his father to follow through with what God had in store for him and for humanity by agreeing to give his life for us in accordance to God's will, despite the physical and emotional agony you knew that he knew he would go through. Like some of us don't love other people because of the agony that we know we may have. We know that we're not going to have that reciprocal love from them. And Jesus knew exactly what was coming for him. And he stepped into the center of God's will to agape love us, even in spite of the physical and emotional agony he knew he was going to go through. That's agape love. I love pizza, but I don't love pizza in that same way. I need to sacrifice pizza, as a matter of fact, so that I can go up in other things in my life. But if we're being really honest, whether a long-term follower of Christ or someone still processing our thoughts, there's a tension when we start to talk about the love of God. As a matter of fact, in our city where 95% of people are spiritually disconnected from Christ and they have big, looming, overarching questions about the scriptures, one of the, the common responses I get when talking about a loving God is often this question, how could a loving God allow suffering? Chris, you say that God is loving. You say that there's this agape love that he has. You say that it's the epitome and the epicenter of love. But I just don't understand how a loving God could allow suffering. Can I just acknowledge, like, that's a difficult question to really wrestle with. If God is loving, sacrificial, agape in nature, why does he allow those things to happen? But I want to start by saying this. I don't think it's the right question when we're talking about the love of God. And I'll explain that a little bit later, but I think we also have to consider a few truths when we talk about suffering. Number one, here's this truth, like suffering is universal. Suffering is universal to everyone. Your suffering and someone else's suffering may seem different, but who's to judge whose suffering is worse than the other suffering? It's universal in nature, right? Someone may be walking through a physical ailment that is suffering, and other people may like have their internet out in their house, and that is suffering for them, right? I mean, like people think that those are the same thing. Other people may have suffering that they root for a baseball team that's like the worst in all of major leagues, and it's okay. I'm doing all right with that, all right? It's okay. The Rocky, we'll get there. And no, I'm suffering through this. Like suffering is universal, but who's to say that one person's suffering is, another, uh, is worse than another person's suffering? Wouldn't that then point to some sort of supreme type of ruler that would make that decision? Whose suffering is worse? Suffering is universal, but don't we also know this? Suffering shapes us. I mean, you, you know, hey, I, it can't be a comeback without some type of setback, right? We see this all the time. Whether an athlete or whether a CEO or whether a business owner or whether somebody that's making billions of dollars, it's like, man, we talk about the hardships that they had in the very beginning of their business starting, right? We talk about the, the time and effort musicians put in to get their 10,000 hours to be a professional. We talk about the torn ACLs and it can't be a comeback without a setback. Doesn't suffering shape us in a way that we use to like motivate us and drive us. I often think about Joseph in the scriptures. Adam mentioned him last week. And Joseph is thrown into a pit by his brothers for no reason whatsoever. Then he gets put in prison for no reason whatsoever. Good reason, right? And and so he has all of this happen. Don't you know that time and time again, Joseph, Joseph was like, God, why is this happening to me? Why is this suffering happening to me? But guess what? When he gets to the penthouse and he's the ruler of all of Egypt and all that's going on, don't you know that being in the pit and the prison shaped him and his relationship with God so that he could rule in a way that would bring God honor and glory and praise? Suffering shapes us in a way. I think it actually points to God's existence. Our desire for good and justice points to a good and just God. C.S. Lewis famously said it this way. He said, my argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? It points to 
something greater. Suffering is universal. Suffering shapes us. Don't you know what caused suffering? We see it in the very beginning of the scriptures. It's called sin. It's called living outside of the way God desires us to live, what we call sin. Like the world was perfect, walking in perfect harmony, no suffering, no anything, and then sin entered the picture with Adam and Eve. Our sin sometimes causes the suffering that we walk through because of the consequences of our mistakes. And then last but certainly not least, when we're talking about suffering and and God and how could he allow it, I cannot help but to get back to the point and to the truth that God is not immune to your suffering at all. Do you know how hard it would have been to send his only son to take the place of other people's sins? He sent his sinless perfect son to be fully human and fully divine to live a sinless life so that he could ultimately be murdered hung on a cross buried in a tomb and risen on the third day god is not immune to our suffering at all he had to have walked through it himself so i said the wrong question and i think when we we say how does a good god allow suffering what we're really asking is this question right here Why isn't God acting in my suffering? Why isn't God doing something? If he loves me, if this agape love is real, why isn't he acting on the suffering that is going on in my life? I think if that's the question we're ultimately asking, it's also the wrong question. Because can I tell you something? God has already acted on your suffering. It's called the person and work of Jesus Christ. Like that's ultimately the acting of God in your life because a relationship with the one that died for our sin, that took the place of our sin, that relationship brings a new hope, it brings a new perspective, it brings fresh mercies, it brings grace into our life. Like that is acting on part of our suffering. He already did this. The answer is Jesus Christ and that's love. It's agape, it's sacrificial, even in spite of us. That's love. And it's a love above all other loves. Like we can't even experience that love from other people. When you begin to realize this truth, this agape sacrificial love, if you're like me, then you start to ask yet another question. And the question is this, how could a loving God know me and still love me? I think that's also another question that we wrestle with time and time again. We project our thinking of love onto God. You know, if somebody did these things to me the same way I do these things against God, I wouldn't love them the way he loves me. And so I don't know how God could know me and still love me. Many of you think I'm past God's love. You think that I've messed up, I've done too much, I've sinned, I continue in this sin, I can't seem to get out of my own way, I fall back into the same mistakes. And that thought, those notions keep you from fully receiving the agape love of God. You, you have problems receiving that someone would love you this much. You've shamed yourself into thinking that he could not possibly love you. And dare I say it this way, even some Christians have shamed you for the things that you have done for saying that God doesn't love you fully. And that is not right, and that is not true. Sometimes Christians can be the worst in, front of the, in, in terms of the projections that we put on people and the things that we say to people and the way that we shame some people. But can I tell you something? You can never outrun the outstretched arms of God. You can never outrun the outstretched arms of an agape loving God. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. I don't even care where you think you are going. You cannot outrun God's love for you. It cannot happen. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that we just get to sit and do whatever we want to and sit in our sin and not desire to get out of it. But don't think that you can't or that God can never love you because of it. He's the literal definition of a sacrificial, everlasting love, even you. It says, for God so loved the world, for God loved the world in this way, so that everyone who believes, it doesn't say everyone, asterisk, stipulation, unless you've done these things. It says so that everyone who believes will not perish but have everlasting life. So it's so crystal clear. 
that no matter what the world says, no matter what the world will try to sway you to believe, no matter what you tell yourself and the lie that you try to believe, a God that sends his son for you, despite you, loves you. A God that sent his son for you, despite you, loves you. Do me a favor, look to your your favorite neighbor and look at them and say, for you, despite you, loves you. Now, 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 do me another favor, look to your other neighbor and say, hey, I'm sorry, you're not my favorite. (laughs) But for you, despite you, loves you. Like a God that sent his son for you, despite you, he loves you. And let me say it this way, internally right now, say this, for you. Me? Despite me? He loves me. For me, despite me, he loves me. And so the question becomes okay, like, this is a love for me. Like, this is where my identity should rest. If I'm looking for love, I'm looking for it from the Father in this way. And so the question becomes now what? And that's a, that's a famous John 3.16 passage that we just walked through, but I, I think there's an even, uh, even better John 3.16 passage that we don't talk about as much, and it's in 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. It's in the epistle part of the New Testament, and it says this. It says, this is how we have come to know love. So how do we know love? How do we know agape love? That he laid down his life for us. That's talking about Jesus. But here's the kicker. Now what do we do when we understand the agape love of God? We should also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Once we know the agape love of God, of Jesus that gave his life for us, we now should move and love other people, laying down our lives for our brothers and sisters. It kind of sounds like loving yourself allows you to love others. Matter of fact, I would say loving yourself, it commands you to love others. When you know your identity in God, when you know who God made you to be and what God has called you to do, no matter who you are, no matter what is going on, a God that loves you and sent his son to lay down his life for you means that we need to go and love others in the same way. You see, when we love others, this is love in action because our love for God is expressed in our love for others. It's love in action when we're loving other people. A loving God allows you to love yourself, which gives you the power to love others. Theologian John Calvin said this. He said, the sum of what, the sum of what is said is, talking about 1 John 3, 16, the sum of what is said is that our love is approved We're loved. It's approved. Stamp it, you're loved. And our love is approved when we transfer the love of ourselves to our brethren so that everyone in a manner forgetting himself should seek the good of others. We receive God's love. That love is approved when we are using that love to love other people. Loving ourselves. Because God loves us, allows us to love other people. And so last but certainly not least, I think those questions that we wrestle with in the love of God allows us to know these truths. Number one, you cannot love others if you are only focused on your stuff. You cannot love others if you're only focused on your stuff. Did you know that we live in a what's in it for me world? We live in a what have you done for me lately, thank you Janet Jackson, world, and we start to think I should be loved. Someone should sacrifice for me. And we start to think about, well, what about my suffering, God? But it's so hard to love other people when you're only focused on loving yourself in that way. 
You got to love yourself because God loves you, not because you demand other people to love you. You need to love yourself in that way, but you don't need to sit back and worry about getting loved because it's already clear that God has stamped us with his love. In fact, when you embrace God's love, it actually frees you to love other people because you're not looking for love in other people around you. Because what happens is we don't love others because we're so busy seeking after love for ourself and our stuff. But when we understand that God loves us in that way, agape love, then we're freed to actually walk around and love other people because my identity rests in him when I receive his love. If my freedom and love is in Christ, then I don't have to worry about others letting me down and not loving me. And then the second truth is this. You can't love yourself or others if your identity is off. If your identity is off, you're not going to be able to love yourself or other people. Can I tell you something? You are not your job. You are not your career. You are not your situation. You are not your relationships. You are not your bank account. You are not the success that you desire. You are not the success that you desire your kids to have. You are not the number of friends that you have. You are not the home that you own, and you are not the money in your bank account or the cars that you drive. When you understand the love of God, you understand it in this way, that you are an agape loved child of God. You are an agape loved child of God that he sent his son for. You are an agape loved child of God that he has a plan for. You are an agape loved child of God that he has a purpose for your life. You are an agape loved child of God that your identity rests in him and nothing else. That's agape love. And when we understand that, we then put love into action towards others because we can love others others when our identity rests in him and we love ourselves because our identity rests in him. So church, can I ask you this question as we get ready to close? As we get ready to wrap up in worship, can I ask you this question? Is your love in action? Like is your love in action in your life? Is it an agape everlasting, sacrificial love that you are giving to other people? Or do you just love some pizza when you're loving your neighbors? Quite frankly, are you loving pizza when you love God? Is it the same love? Because love in action means sacrificial. By the way, you're here this morning sacrificing your time. I hope it's not because of your love for Journey Point, your love for me or anybody else, but I hope it's out of a love for God. These people serve with sound and music and lights and children's and serving our community. We don't do that because of our love for our community. Yes, we love our community, but we do that because of our love for God. But our love for God is expressed in our love for community. Our love for God is expressed in our love for others. Like, do you love others in action? Or is it just a word and a phrase that you throw around and use? Yeah, 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 I love God. Yeah, yeah, I love it. I went to church that one time. I love him. Do you read his word? Because when my kids say that they love me, I know that they love me. Sometimes I know that their love is just like they just have to love me. And so oftentimes I look at them and I say, I don't just love you, but I like you. And that just means that I want to show them, I want to express that like, I don't have to do this thing, but I'm doing this because I love you. So I'm sacrificing my time with you, God, because I love you. I'm serving my time, God, with you because I love you. I'm giving of my resources in a generous way, not because I believe that, that we'll just go and do all of these things with the resources, but no, I'm doing it because I love you, God. Like when we love God, it's expressed in our action towards others. 
is your love in action. And then I'll close with this. Does anybody have like a neighbor that kind of gets on their nerves a little bit? It's one person, everybody else is lying. <laughs> that you're just like, man, they're hard to love. You don't know, Chris. Like we, we have some that we're like, that's the sheriff of the street. You know, that they're, they're keeping all things in order. They know everything that is going on, right? We have some that I'm like, man, I've said this before, but like when we lived in the South and it was like really hot, like you had the, the dad that had the like dad shorts and it was like doing yard work. And I'm like, dude, you don't need to be wearing that while you're doing yard work. Nobody in our neighborhood needs to see that right now, right? It's like full on dad bod and he wants everybody to know it. Like, and we just identified with those people. We had Alabama fans that lived next to us. That's another story for another day. Hard to love. We have the people that we don't see eye to eye with on issues, maybe politically, moralistically, in our same worldview. But could you imagine your street if you agape loved them in action? If, if you, if you, maybe you had some tension, maybe they didn't take care of the weeds, maybe they, they parked in front of your house too many times. I mean, we, parking is scarce here in Central Park, and so maybe they keep parking in front of your house or whatever it is. And, and like, instead of just getting mad and going inside and talking about it, you walked up to them and like, you know what? In spite of you parking in front of my house again, I love you. In spite of the things that we don't see eye to eye on, I love you and I want to spend time with you and I want to hang out with you and I want to get to know you. Like what if we agape loved the people in our lives that God's bringing? Don't you think our neighborhoods would look a little bit different? Don't you think our community would look drastically different? Don't you think that our our region here would look drastically different? Our state would look different? The western part of the United States would look different? The U if we just love some people, wouldn't the United States look a little bit different? Like Fox News and CNN and MSNBC and all that. that, that we, what if we just didn't have anything to talk about like we did because we loved each other so much? I think that's what God is calling us to. Is to swallow some of our pride, swallow some of our hurt, swallow some of our pain, swallow some of the things that we don't want to walk into. And he's telling us to put our love into action for other people. Why? Because even in spite of us, he loved us by sending his son for us and then calls and commands us to then go do the same thing for others. That's agape love. It's the highest form of love. It's love in action, church. And so right now as we pray, I want to close by just asking you this. Who can you agape love this week? Maybe it's somebody that has hurt you and is not giving that love back that you have been giving. And I want you to think about who is it that you can agape love this week in some sort of way. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we love you, but it is abundantly clear that we only love you because you first loved us. It is abundantly clear that in spite of us, despite us, despite me, God, you still love me. Father, even when I fail time and time again and fall short, Lord, you still love me. And Father, I pray that, number one, we would embrace that kind of love from you. God, that we would embrace that there is a God that no matter who we are, no matter what we've done, no matter where we've been, no matter where we think we are headed, no matter what we think we can't overcome or what other people have wrongfully shamed us of, God, you love us. So much so in a way that you sent your only son to die for us. And Father, I pray that we would take that love that we would embrace that love, that we would be able to love ourselves because of the love that you give us and that we would not stop there, but we would allow that love to be put forth in action to other people. Help us, God. Think of the one person that it's hard to love. And I pray that you would give us grace and compassion and mercy and boldness this week to love them. 
in the same way that you loved us. And Father, I pray that if there is anyone here that has never received your love, never knew of your son, Jesus Christ, and his death, burial, and resurrection for them, God, I pray right now that you would give them a confidence and a boldness to believe. Not only just to believe, Lord, but, but to ask you to forgive them of their sin that, that puts you there on that cross. And that they would ask you to lead their life. Lord, that prayer would go something like this. Lord, I believe that you died for me and that you were buried and risen on the third day. And I believe that my sin is what puts you there. And so, Father, forgive me of that sin. And, Father, I pray that you would lead my life in every aspect, in every way. Father, I pray that people would pray that, that have never said that prayer, God, that they would step into a eternal life that is with you from a loving father for the first time. Do what only you can. Do the work that only you can. Lord, let us embrace and step into your love and let our city look differently because of it. It's in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.